Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be talking about John Knox in our continuing study of the history of Christianity. I don't know exactly when Knox was born, uh, sometime just prior to Luther hammering his 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg Castle. Knox was the son of a merchant, but he studied for the priesthood at the University of St. Andrews, uh, apparently was a, a successful student, and then he came to hear the gospel and was conformed uh, converted, I should say, by Reformed teaching. Um, the uh, George Wishart had, was the one who had uh, converted him, and he went on to become the tutor to the sons of a Scottish lord who also had come under Reformed teaching. And so Knox was, was passing those teachings on uh, to these two young men. He served as the bodyguard for the same George Wishart, who had, had brought him to Christ. Well, Wishart himself was a, a Scottish reformer. He was a fiery preacher and took the gospel and the Reformation uh, throughout Scotland. He preached against the veneration of Mary, and uh, that was a doctrine dear to the Roman Catholics. Uh, still is today. It's still part of their teaching today to to venerate. Um, they would say, well, we don't actually pray to Mary. We pray through her. That is, we, we ask Mary to pray on our behalf, and it's similar to when you might ask a friend to pray for you. Uh, the problem is that Mary, is uh, she is not omnipresent, and so they are ascribing to her something that's, that's inappropriate. And, and so he preached against that practice. He also translated the Helvetic, the, remember the confession that comes from Switzerland uh, that Zwingli had, uh, had transcribed. He translates that into the Scottish language, and he is ultimately arrested, and he'll be burned as a heretic. Knox was willing to be arrested with him, but Wishart said, no, no, it's, it's better that you be free. You can, uh, those two boys uh, of whom you were tutoring, you can uh, continue to be with them. Uh, and they actually had to go into hiding. Uh, and so he becomes a fugitive. He is elected as the chaplain at St. Andrew's Castle, um, uh, he had found refuge there, and uh, the castle actually comes under siege, um, where the uh, the Roman Catholic authorities actually uh, go in league with the French, and the French uh, send a ship, and they they uh, capture the castle, and he is captured and sentenced to, I don't know if it was a life sentence, he's not going to serve at all, but he is sentenced to be a galley slave. Uh, perhaps you've seen that old... Uh, uh, movie Ben Hur, where uh, the Romans are, are pictured in the movie at least as having slaves that would be chained to the oars. Uh, they didn't actually do that in Roman times. Uh, the, the movie is inaccurate with that regard. Uh, but the author of the book Ben Hur, the, the where he got that from, was from the French practice. They actually would use slaves uh, and, and they would chain them to oars. And um, so Knox found himself in that position and for about a year and a half. He served the sentence as a galley slave. At one point, he writes uh, about how uh, some of his friends said, uh, look at that lighthouse that we're rowing past. Uh, it was uh, apparently in the area of Scotland. Do you remember that lighthouse? And, and Knox said, yes, that's the place where I trusted in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's the place where I came to understand the gospel. Uh, and even there, he he felt that, that he, and he writes about how he felt that he would not spend the rest of his life there as a slave, but that he would gain his freedom. And and sure enough, uh, after 18 months, uh, he did, now we don't know the details, how that happened. What, did he escape? Was he set free? We don't know the details, but he regained his freedom and uh, escaped, or, or at least made his way out of that condition. From now, he goes to England. Scotland was a dangerous place for him, and so he takes up a preaching ministry in England. You say, well, how can England be any safer? Uh, you'd had you'd had uh, Henry VIII. He had uh, parted from the Roman Catholic Church, but in theology, he still was holding to Roman Catholic theology. But he had died now, and so his, his uh, son, Edward VI, was now on the throne, who was uh, embracing Reformation and Protestantism. Uh, Knox uh, was married, and he becomes now the 
royal chaplain under, one of the royal chaplains, under Edward VI. He's allowed to preach and to minister. Um, he actually preaches and writes against what was called the, uh, the black rubric, uh, that is against kneeling to take the Lord's Supper. He says, you know, there's no record that, that the apostles kneeled when they sat at the table or reclined at the table. And, and perhaps we shouldn't be doing that either. We're, by kneeling, you're, you're, you're perhaps indicating that the Lord's ta- uh, Supper, the bread and the wine, are actually becoming the body and blood of Jesus. That's what the Roman Catholic Church taught. And, and he's saying, no, um, it's, it's, it's certainly a memorial, and you're certainly meeting Jesus. Uh, but but the bread and the wine are still bread and wine. They don't become anything. And so he had rejected that teaching and th- thus spoke against the kneeling. Uh, now, uh, Edward VI only lives uh, into his late teens, and then he dies. He was a, a sickly young man. And his, uh, his half-sister Mary, who gets the title Bloody Mary, now comes to the throne. And she is Roman Catholic to the core. Uh, remember, it was her uh, mother who had been divorced by uh, Henry VIII, uh, who said, well, I can't get my divorce under the Roman Catholic Church, so we have to uh, leave that church. Well, uh, she doesn't want to see that divorce as being legal, and so she says, let's go back and be Roman Catholics again. And John Knox, again, is forced to leave, not, not this time Scotland, now he's forced to leave England. And so he finds himself eventually, he goes to a number of different places, but he finds himself in Geneva, the place where, where Calvin resides. He speaks about Calvin's Geneva and the school there. He says, it is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. And uh, he gets to know Calvin, and they converse, and he studies under Calvin and has his theology um, uh, refined uh, as though through uh, this careful study under, under Calvin. He asks some questions and writes on some issues uh, during this time. One of those issues is, can a woman rule a nation and transfer her rights to her husband? And, of course, he's writing about a very specific issue. This is uh, Bloody Mary, uh, and uh, there's some plans afoot for her to take on a Roman Catholic husband, um, the, the, in Spain, they're they're uh, all about uh, restoring this this union. Um, the second paper can a, can magistrates who enforce idolatry? You say idolatry? Well, that's what he's accusing the Roman Catholic Church of of engaging in idolatry with their icons and and veneration of icons. Uh, and so he says, can can magistrates who enforce idolatry be disobeyed? He's speaking specifically about Bloody Mary. Uh, The third paper, can Christians support a religious nobility resisting an idolatrous ruler? And all three of these questions, all three of these writings, deal with the issue of Bloody Mary. Of course, she's eventually going to die, but but there will be others who will hear of these writings too. They're going to have multiple applications. His prayer during this time, give me Scotland, ere I die. He had a passion, a desire to return to Scotland and to take the Reformation uh, and the gospel back to his beloved Scotland. He moves to Frankfurt in Germany, um, and there he is minister for a time that doesn't really work out. And then he returns to Scotland. He'll he'll go back and forth. Um, he returns to Scotland, uh, but there's still issues there. He's in danger. Uh, he has to go into hiding again. There is Mary, Queen of, of Guys. Uh, she is there. Um, and uh, Knox is actually placed on trial. Uh, Mary Queen of Guise is a Roman Catholic. She's actually from France. We'll talk about more about her uh, in just a moment. Uh, he's placed on trial before bishops, but he is allowed to preach. And so he re- returns to Geneva, it's sort of uh, up in the air, whether uh, he's going to be uh, arrested and put in prison, but he's not. Uh, he returns to Geneva for a time. And it's here that he writes his, what's called the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regime 
a woman. <laughs> and again, uh, he's looking at two things. First, uh, there had been Bloody Mary, but there was also Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, and so uh, he's, he's addressing it to these issues, notice to which is added the contents of the second blast and a letter from John Knox to the people of Edinburgh. And so he's writing uh, in these issues. Um, he shows his writing to Calvin. And Calvin says, you know, it's not that I disagree, but maybe you shouldn't be publishing this. And, and actually advises him against his publication. Uh, he doesn't listen. He goes, he goes ahead and publishes this. Uh, it's after this that Queen Elizabeth now is going to replace Bloody Mary. <laughs> now, uh, and Queen Elizabeth is not Roman Catholic. Uh, she's trying to find a middle way. She's saying, look, I'm Queen of England. I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to be the head of the church necessarily, although um, her father had taken the title where the king is head of the church. Uh, but she's, she's trying to rule her people, and she has Roman Catholics, and she has uh, those that are Reformed, and she's, um, she's over the Church of England. And she's trying to find them a way to get them all to work together. And of course, Knox has written this against the monstrous regime of woman. She is a, a woman, but she doesn't want to necessarily go against Knox. And so he returns uh, again a second time to Scotland, 1559. Um, and he's an outlaw uh, there. And the Protestants have a revolt now against Mary, Queen of, of uh, Geis. Um, and she's going to be ousted. I have to talk a little bit about what's been happening in the British Isles. You'd had Henry VIII previously. Remember, he was the one who had first parted from the the um, the Roman Catholic Church, but not in order to be reformed, in order just to, to have a church that would grant him divorce. Um, and then you'd had James V of Scotland, who had been Roman Catholic, and both Henry VIII and James V had been both Roman Catholic. And there wasn't any love loss between these two. Uh, think back to that movie Braveheart. It, it, it has some historical inaccuracies, but it get, did get one thing right. Uh, the Scots and the, the British uh, the English and the Scot uh, did not always get along. Uh, and then Mary, Queen of Geis, who was from, she was from France, but she's going to marry James V, and they're going to have a child, a daughter. But five days after the birth of that daughter, James V dies. And so you have a daughter who could be the next uh, one on the throne, but uh, she's only five days old. And so Mary, Queen of Guise, is going to be the one who is the regent for her daughter. Now, Count Knox comes along, and by this time, Henry VIII has died, and we've gone to Mary Tudor, that is Bloody Mary. Um, and, and so Bloody Mary's on the throne of England. And Knox writes his first blast of the trumpet, where you've got a, a woman reigning as regent in Scotland. You've got a woman on the throne of England down in the south. And so the first blast might be the first blast, but it's actually got, uh, it's, it's blasting in two directions, as it were. After Bloody Mary dies, now Elizabeth is on the throne, and and uh, she's saying, "Look, Knox, did you have to write that about woman? You could have written about Bloody Mary. That's one thing uh, about Mary, Queen of Guys, but uh, you pointed it against woman instead, and that's you know uh, that wasn't very uh, politically correct." And so he comes now to Scotland, and Mary, Queen of Guys. And she's the one that's, that's the regent. And the issue, as the Reformation is now taking hold in Scotland, um, and yet she's Roman Catholic, uh, how is this going to be divided? And she actually asked the question, are you fomenting a revolt against me? And he says, no, no. Um, even the Apostle Paul was preaching in Rome when Nero was there. Nero was a pagan, and, and you're sort of a, I think he's insinuating, you're sort of a pagan too. Uh, but uh, no, as long as you uh, do the right thing, as long as you're not uh, persecuting people, then you have the right to, to govern and govern uh, correctly. And so, but she's eventually going to be deposed. Um, she will be deposed, and the Scots will now... Uh, affirm a confession that will 
that will be reformed in its outlook. In fact, we're going to call and give it the name Presbyterian. That just means elder, because the church now will be governed by elders. Uh, and Knox, we could say, is the father of that Presbyterianism. Um, and so the Presbyterian church now comes about in Scotland, and that's going to take root. In fact, uh, that's where the you know you have Presbyterian churches all, all over the world, but they they really come the name and the the tradition comes here from Knox through Scotland. Now, Mary Queen of Scots is remember we said there was a child that was born. Um, that's going to be Mary Queen of Scots as she grows up, and. Uh, she eventually will become the queen. She's the daughter, daughter of Mary of Guise. And she's had this Roman Catholic upbringing, so she's also Roman Catholic, but now she's governing a country that is largely and is becoming more and more Presbyterian. And she uh, reveals plans to marry the son, uh, I think Juan Carlos was his name, uh, the son of Philip II of Spain. Philip II is the one who wanted to marry uh, Queen Elizabeth and uh, sort of unite their countries, and, and that didn't go well. Think of the Spanish Armada. Um, and so here Mary, Queen of Scots, has plans to marry the son of Philip II of Spain, which would now bring in a foreign ruler, a foreign Roman Catholic ruler, <laughs> and, and Knox speaks out against that. You know, she says, you know, who are you to speak against my marriage? You know, I can marry who I want. And he says, no, that's going to affect the entire country. Um, and so she, he confronts her, and at, at one point she is brought to tears. He comments, I never delighted in the weeping of any of God's creatures. Yea, I can scarcely well abide the tears of my own boys whom my hand corrects. Much less can I rejoice in your majesty's weeping. Um, and so uh, he's dealing with both the nation as well as the people. He is the minister to the entire nation. Uh, as a result, we have in England, we're going to see the Anglican Church. That just means the English Church. Um, and uh, it will have it will look on the outside much like the Roman Catholic Church as far as the, the pomp and the ceremony. But it will have been heavily influenced by the Reformed tradition. So uh, they're trying to find the middle way. Whereas in Scotland, uh, the Presbyterian, that's not going to be finding the middle way. That's going to be uh, a, a Reformed outlook, a Reformed church in the tradition of uh, First Luther, but also, also Calvin. Now, finally, we want to talk about some of the issues. We've sort of skirted around them in, in this lecture. Uh, Roman Catholics versus the Reformers. The Roman Catholics uh, saw church tradition as carrying equal authority with the scriptures, even today. Uh, that's the claim. And you say, well, where's the Pope in that? Uh, he's the one who, who sets the tradition. Uh, so uh, you would say church tradition and the papacy uh, carrying equal authority with the scriptures. The reformers, Knox and Calvin and Luther, all said that scriptures, the scripture alone is the final rule of faith and practice. And remember, Calvin had taken it one step further to say, uh, our worship, uh, it's not just what's forbidden in Scripture, our worship must align with the Scriptures, and, and Knox takes that same approach. The Roman Catholics uh, would say, and still say today, that salvation comes as one cooperates with the grace of God. The Reformers, by contrast, said that salvation comes by grace through faith alone that salvation is God's work on our behalf. Now, it's not saying that we don't work, but we work as a result of that salvation, not in order to receive that salvation. The Roman Catholics say that justification is an infusion of grace to make you live better, that, that God comes, and you know, they would say, by grace are you saved? Uh, yes, you are saved by grace, that God infuses his grace into you, and he makes you into a better person, and now you are declared righteous, you are justified on that basis. The Reformers taught, no, that justification is an imputation, that it is a crediting, a reckoning of Christ's righteousness. Uh, Christ's righteousness is reckoned or credited or imputed to you, and therefore you are declared righteous because of Christ's righteousness that was credited on your behalf.